الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد ما جو brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته a couple of months back it's probably about two months back now I received an email saying we're putting an event together where we would like someone to present on Islam do you think you can come and present for us so I was a bit taken back because the organization that had sent me this email was called Knights of the Round Table. And I didn't know what to expect. So I thought this was some like hidden society that was looking for a presentation. And they're like Freemasons and like world, New World Order, all this stuff is going through my head as I'm heading to this event. I arrive at the event and it's actually a senior citizens club where the average age, I would say, is about 70 plus years old. And I've never presented to an audience like that. Very unique uh, experience for sure. During the Q&A session, an elderly lady, and this is what I, I loved about the, the, the elderly folks, is that they're uncandid, no filter, no, we are, you know, no worry of political correctness. They speak what's on their mind. And she asks, you know, do you find that Muslims are becoming more Canadian? And I asked her, what do you mean by Muslims becoming more Canadian? Like, can you be more specific? And she's like, well, do you think Muslim women are starting to take off their hijab? And I was like, is that really what you understand by being Canadian is take a woman taking off her hijab? And she's like, yeah, well, women should have the right to wear what they want when they want. And I told her, I completely agree with you. No one should dictate to a woman what she wears and when she wears it. However, that choice to put on the hijab is what makes Canada a beautiful place. That if she chooses to do so, no one can discriminate against her and no one can put her down and no one can antagonize her for that choice. And this woman looked a bit perplexed, but I noticed that it took a, five, like a couple of seconds to reflect over this and that's when everyone started clapping that that's what made Canada a beautiful place. That if a woman chose to wear hijab, then society would accept her for who she is and would not judge her based upon her faith or based upon her looks, but rather based upon what she brings to the table and offers. And that's the opportunity that Canada presented. Now this concept of, of migration, you know, it's very, very interesting that when you look at the Islamic history of Canada, Alhamdulillah, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary as a nation of, of Canada. And on July 1st itself, there's, um, you know, an article that's you know, started out from Ottawa, but went viral all over the world. It was about the Islamic history of Canada. And I'm not sure if some of you had a chance to read it or not. But if you did get a chance to read it, you'll notice that the very first thing that is mentioned, who was the first Canadian born, born Muslim in Canada? Who was the first born Muslim in Canada? And you go back, not to the 1900s, not to the 1890s, you go back to 1854. 1854 is the first documented birth of a Muslim in Canada. Now, you may be thinking, where were they from? Were they Somali? Were they Indian Pakistani? Were they Arab? What were they? The baby was born to James and Agnes Love from Scotland. That was the first documented Muslim birth in Canada. And I found that to be something so unique. I mean, I would love to hear the story of how James and Agnes Love had given birth to the first Muslim child in Canada. I didn't get a chance to research it further, but that was the first thing that I saw. Now, the very first census that was done in 1871 that documented Muslims shows that there were 13 Muslims in 1871 in Canada. You move forward 100 years to 1971, that number has grown to 33,000. You move forward even further, and the most recent census showed that there were over a million Muslims in Canada. This is exponential growth going from 13 to 33,000 to over a million Muslims and roughly around 1.2 million Muslims in Canada right now. So it shows us that the Muslim faith as a community is growing rapidly. Now what has our experience been like? And now we believe our experience, you know, it, it's gone through many, many phases. For me particularly, I think the first major shift in experience happened in the post 9-11 world where for the first time I started to notice that Muslims started to feel uncomfortable in their skin. You move forward a couple of years, then the England attacks happened in 7-7. You move forward a couple of years and more attacks are happening. And I noticed that the experience in Canada actually started getting a lot more challenging. 
particularly under the previous administration. Let us not forget what that experience was like where on a daily basis, a woman that chose to wear niqab in her oath of citizenship is being plastered on every single newspaper. Why? Because this incident took place a total of like three times in Canada, but it became a polarized issue in which we would choose to do debate and bring to the forefront because it seemed so important at that time should a woman be given the right to wear a niqab in her oath of citizenship when in, in our history it's happened about three times. And that shows us what the previous administration was all about. But then you move forward to this administration and this administration is a, is a breath of fresh air altogether. Alhamdulillah, we saw our, our, our Prime Minister wearing uh, you know, Eid Mubarak socks, which was a, a very interesting experience because I'm interested to know where did he get those socks because I've never seen those around. Now, with this experience shifting, how does this affect us and what can we learn from it through, you know, through the lens of our history here in Canada? Well, the first thing I want to address in terms of our history in Canada the infrastructure that we've invested in Canada as a Muslim community, what, where did it begin? Well, the first infrastructure we developed as a public space was actually in Edmonton, and that was Masjid al-Rashid. And I want to share a beautiful quote with you when we talk about heroism. So take a brief second and think about who are modern day heroes that you know that are alive? Who are modern day heroes that you know that are alive? I remember when I was asked this question, I couldn't think of very, very many. You know, I, I thought of individuals that I know personally in my community that sacrifice their lives, their hours, their time to be in the service of the community. But to think people on a larger scale that are modern day heroes, I couldn't think of too, too many. Now, the reason why I ask you this question is because if we can't think of modern day heroes, does that mean that our definition of who a hero is, is construed? Or maybe we're just living in a day and age where there aren't as many heroes as there should be. Or perhaps there's a third reason. And I think that's what it actually is, is the third reason. Because how do we define who a hero is? A hero is an individual that shows courage in the face of fear for the sake of being compassionate to others. He's an individual that shows courage in the face of fear for the sake of being compassionate to others. Meaning sometimes we're courageous for recognition. Sometimes we're courageous because it's just an instantaneous thing that happens. Did you know what? It seems like the right thing. Let, just let me do it. But you truly become a hero when you do it for the sake of others intentionally. You're doing this so other people will have rights, freedoms, and privileges that you may be denied. But if it means they get to have it and you're willing to be courageous at that time, so be it. And that is what makes people heroes. And I think people only realize who their heroes are after they pass away. And they realize that they're no longer amongst them. And we've seen several heroes. You look at our history of people like Muhammad Ali, the boxer, rahimahullah. You get people like Malcolm X, the social activist. These are our heroes. But why is it that anytime there's a discussion about the Muslim community, you always see someone angry and enraged. That's what is brought to the forefront. So now, getting back to our topic of infrastructure in Canada, there was a lady who I believe a lot of us don't even know her name. Her name was Hilwi Hamdan. Hilwi Hamdan was of Lebanese descent and her uh, parents migrated to Canada in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s. And while she was there, she's like, you know what, we don't have a place to pray. We need to establish a mosque so that we can start praying together as a community. So in 1936 or 1937, she goes to the mayor at that time in Edmonton, who is John Fry. And she goes to John Fry and says, look, I'm of Muslim origin, and in our faith, Muslims gather together on Fridays, and we need a place to pray. So John Fry, the mayor at that time, was very intrigued. He said, you know what, here's a, a, a piece of land, you can develop it uh, for yourself, and that's like the most help that I can give. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, this shows us the pluralism of Canada, you know, in its early onset. It's not a new concept in Canada of being pluralistic. But John Fry is displaying that, that he gave this land away so that Muslims could develop their first masjid. Now, Hilwi Hamdan faced a challenge. She has a piece of land that is not developed and has no infrastructure. And together at that time in Edmonton, you roughly have about maybe, you know, 2,000 Muslims altogether, even if that. How is she going to raise this money to build a mosque? 
Well, she was determined. So there's a famous street in Edmond called Jasper Avenue. She walks down Jasper Avenue, store by store, going to each store, telling them about who she is, what her faith was, and what she's trying to do. And by the end of a year or so, she was able to raise $5,000. And she comments that the vast majority of donors were Christian and Jewish faith members that believed in her cause, that people of faith should have a place to gather and congregate. And they're the ones that donated. $5,000 was donated by non-Muslims to build the very first mosque in Canada. And in December 12th, 1938, the very first mosque in Canada is built in Masjid al-Rashid. Now you will notice, my dear brothers and sisters, that our predecessors, our parents and their parents, and the first migrants did an amazing job of building masajid. You go to every major city in Canada, you will find a masjid. In fact, one of the very earliest masajid built in Canada, and this is open for dispute and debate, was it the second, third, or fourth masjid built, but it was in a small town in Alberta called Lac La Biche. And I thought to myself, what type of Muslims were in Lac La Biche that they needed a masjid over there so early on? But it shows us, again, we've done an amazing job in building masajid. But what we need right now is to invest in public spaces, to invest in human infrastructure. Our leadership needs, you know, a rejuvenation. We're an ummah that has been told that all of us are shepherds and all of us shall be asked about our flocks. But in terms of our leadership, alhamdulillah, we're starting to see this awakening, but we still have so much further to go in terms of providing services for the greater community that are exclusive to the community, yet at the same time are inclusive of the greater community as well. What do I mean by that? We need spaces where we can feel comfortable as who we are practicing our faith and not be challenged in that. So if a woman wants to see a female doctor, if we want to have an Islamic university, all these spaces need to be you know, made available for the Muslim community. You want to talk about Islamic financing, we need to develop in our own financial institutions. This is what our future needs to look like. And I think this is part of the issue of bringing our leadership to the forefront and educating them in terms of what our needs are. And I was very pleased to see, alhamdulillah, that one of the sessions coming on later today is a workshop that is purely an open mic for the youth to talk about and express their concerns about the community. What are the challenges they are facing? What are the things that they need? And what the community can do to provide those services? So for those of you that are out here listening, if there's something on your mind that you think the community needs, please make sure you attend that session and share what you think the community needs moving forward. Now what I wanted to share with you, is looking back at our history, as I was mentioning, through each administration that we've gone through, we've faced several challenges as a community. When you look at the previous administration, our challenge came more from the right wing. And what that looked like was our identity was challenged that every Muslim is branded with a brush of extremism or radicalization. And we're made to doubt our own faith and question our own faith, at least in the public sphere. For those of you from Quebec, you've realized in the past decade or so, there has been this heavy emphasis on, can we tolerate religious symbolism in public space? Now, I attended a beautiful conference just towards the end of June here in Ottawa. And it was hosted by a think tank over here that talked about what is faith in Canada going to look like for the next 150 years? So they invited 75 delegates from all over the country to talk about this topic. What would they like to see in Canada as a faith platform for the next 150 years? And one of the beautiful things that I saw is that an individual that was presenting, he said, faith is an unarticulated Canadian value. And that when we see bad religion, the answer to that is not no religion but rather it is good religion. What does that mean like? What does that look like? And what do we understand from this? Well, if you look at Canada's history, in Canadian history, we are a faith-based nation in our history, right? We started off as a majority Christian nation. Our holidays are Christian holidays. Sunday is a day off. Church bells used to go off. And people used to go to church regularly. Now, yes, over time, there has been a shift from that. 
But in terms of its essence, Canada is a faith-based nation for the most part in terms of its religious symbolisms, in terms of its holidays, and also in terms of its acceptance of other faiths. Faiths have been encouraged in Canada. Now as we move forward and this challenge arises of how do you implement your faith in the public space, a lot of people are critical of faith and religion because they feel that religion brings so much negativity to the table. That it is something that is divisive, it is something that starts wars, it is something that you know, is portrayed in a very negative light. So the solution they promote at that time is let's get rid of all religion from public space. But that is not the answer and that will never be the answer. And I was so proud to hear this from my fellow delegate that the answer to that is good religion, not no religion. So moving forward as a community, that's what we need to be promoting that yes, every faith will have its you know, bad apples as they call it. But we can't let them be the spokespersons for our community. We can't let them be the representatives of our faith. And we need to do a better job of representing ourselves. Because we learn something throughout history. And that is, if you do not write a narrative where you are the hero, someone will not write a narrative where you are the villain. And that is what has happened with the Muslim community for the large part. Now, in this current administration, Alhamdulillah, as I was mentioning, we're very blessed to live in a very multicultural, diverse, and pluralistic, promoting administration. But that comes with its own set of challenges. And this is something I think, as a faith-based community, we haven't fully understood. With the previous administration, when your religious identity is challenged, you hold on to it even further if you truly value it. You will find a way to struggle for it, you will find a way to fight for it, you will find a way to hold on to it. But when you come into a phase of life where everyone is accepting and everyone is accommodating and you get into a comfort zone that starts making you lackadaisical in your approach, almost apathetic where you no longer have to hold on to it. And what happens when you no longer cherish something, you no longer value it, you slowly start to lose it. And that's what my fear is, that we live in such a beautiful country, in such an amazing country that individuals of faith will slowly start losing their religious identity under this guise of pluralism. True pluralism is not about talking about our commonalities and embracing our commonalities. True pluralism, my dear brothers and sisters, is for us to recognize our differences within our community, within our faith, as well as outside of our faith. To recognize those differences, to speak about those differences, and not to tolerate those differences, but to accept them. Because tolerance necessitates that there's something about it that doesn't sit well with me and it is bothering me, but I will tolerate it because it seems like the right thing to do or something that I have to do. But if you can get to a level of acceptance where I acknowledge the fact you have the right to exist as you are with what you believe and who you are, and I will still love you and respect you for who you are, that is where true pluralism exists. Now what that means for our community is that we cannot shy away from speaking about our faith or representing of our faith. And if we are challenged with certain questions that we find difficult, you don't shy away from it, you don't run away from it. But rather you embrace that challenge and you speak about it from a lens of knowledge and education. From the, uh, from the side of, you know what, I may not know the answer, but let me learn and I can come back and share it with you. And that is what true pluralism looks like. And when we get a better understanding of our own faith, when we get confidence in our own faith, the future of Canada as a Muslim community will be just as bright as its history. We felt comfortable enough to come in 1854 to give the first birth. We felt comfortable enough to come to Edmonton and build the first masjid in 1938. And we will feel comfortable enough that moving forward as a community, we will continue to develop infrastructure that is going to contribute not only to our own community, but to the community at large as well. But where is that going to begin from? Acknowledging that we have a lot of work to do on the ground. Amongst ourselves, in our own community, with the greater community, with our youth, with our women, with all of these groups that for the longest part have been marginalized and have been ignored. And like I said, Alhamdulillah, we've started to make positive change and I, I, I commend you for that. But we still have a long way to go. So what I ask my dear brothers and sisters, that as we celebrate Canada's 150th birthday, 
We have seen what Muslim history has been like in Canada. What do you want the next 150 years to look like? And that is what you need to start investing in from today. And go back to that definition of being a hero that I mentioned to you. A hero is to be courageous in the face of fear for the sake of being compassionate to others. Today, I want you to contemplate what it looks like to be compassionate to your grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren. What version of Islam do you want to see practiced at that time? What infrastructure do you want to see for the community at that time? What type of relationship would you like the Muslim community and non-Muslim community to have? Start investing in that today. Our predecessors have done a great job and all you know, props are due to them. But we have a lot of work to do if we want to have just as bright of a future as bright as our history was. So my dear brothers and sisters in this session, I just wanted to give you that small glimpse that Alhamdulillah, we've done an amazing job in our history, but moving forward, we need to be courageous, stand up in the fears that we have and start being compassionate towards our future generations by holding on to our faith and recognizing the differences that we have and talking about those differences and sharing those differences. And don't tolerate those differences, accept those differences. And when you can do that, that is when you have a truly pluralistic society. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq, acceptance and guidance and make us an ummah, a nation of justice and mercy and true pluralism based upon our Islamic values. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.